how did this average family finance its new home? Who would slice up valuable fur into thin strips? What jewelry carries rich memories of one's youth? Where do they make the machines that fly like this? Industry on Parade, a brand new look at our America, produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. At the Philadelphia offices of Sun Oil Company, employees receive certificates, formally notifying them of something they already know. Namely, that they themselves are the owners of a good part of the company. The certificates are stock certificates, representing shares in the assets of the corporation. A similar distribution is underway at all the firm's installations. The company is not just handing out gifts. Nearly 8,000 participating employees paid out hard cash, like other investors, five years ago. But to encourage employee ownership, the company each year since 1926 has put up 50 cents for every dollar invested by an employee, up to 10% of his wages, provided he held on to his shares for five years. That's what these people have done. So now the payoff, $10 million worth this year. In safety deposit vaults, the shares of some employee investors, like Chester Fisher, will continue to earn dividends that will help pay for a comfortable retirement. Already since Chester bought the stock, what with the company contribution and earnings, his investment has brought a return of 142%. Navy veteran Arthur Troutman, a new father, uses his stock certificate as collateral for a loan, getting cash to meet his added responsibilities without relinquishing his shares in the company. The Morrises, Charles and Marjorie, are sinking their shares into a new home. Not all the employee investors hold on to the stock, but enough do year by year so that today well over half the company is owned by its employees. Still another use for the stock is that of George Rolletter, who has decided to turn it over to his daughter, Mary Ann, just out of high school. It will help finance her college education. Many and varied are the benefits of one five-year plan the Russians couldn't even approach. We Americans possess a priceless ingredient which is at a premium in today's troubled world. That ingredient is faith. Faith inherited from our forefathers who forged a nation out of a wilderness. Pioneers who crossed this nation and built great cities on plain and wasteland. America's unshakable faith in God and country enabled us to build, to grow, to prosper in a nation of free men and women. No one from within or from without will ever destroy this nation if we strengthen our faith in our spiritual, political, and economic way of life. do-it-yourself trend moves into the field of fashionable fur wraps for women. No, this gentleman isn't an amateur handyman setting out to make a mink coat for the little woman. He's Harry J. True of New York, very much a professional, and the man who originated the idea of permitting the buyer of a stole or cape to assemble and finish her own garment at a saving of 20 to 30 percent in the cost. Before the buyer lays hands on the fur, though, a lot of highly skilled crafts are called into play. As in the letting out process, for example, the skins, short and blocky looking, are slit into narrow ribbons, which will now be sewed together again in long, beautiful stripes. A skin 12 inches long and 12 inches wide is thus transformed into one 40 inches long and 2 inches wide. Not only more attractive, but the fur also becomes much denser. Every few inches, he starts another narrow ribbon of fur. This letting out technique is perhaps the greatest of the furrier's arts. As each stripe is completed, it is immediately laid in position alongside the other skins with which it will help make up a garment. 
The skins were all matched before work began. He marks them to guide the sewer. Now with the stripes joined together, there begins another operation requiring the skill of long experience. The blocking process to give the garment perfect shape and leave it flat and smooth. With the skin side wet, the fur is nailed all around to the marked out pattern. When he's finished, the garment will be allowed to dry for 24 to 48 hours. You can see why making a fur wrap will never be entirely a do-it-yourself proposition. Two days later, off the blocking board it comes, its shape fixed permanently, or at least for as long as it gets proper treatment. Mink is remarkably durable if you treat it right, one reason why it's a perennial favorite. Once more, the fur is trimmed to conform exactly to the pattern. The parts of a fur garment must be cut so precisely because there is no seam allowance. In other words, there is none of the overlap at the seams that you'll find in cloth garments. The connecting edges just meet. And thus, the man who wields a knife around skins costing many hundreds of dollars has to know his business. Fur is glazed, a little steam, then some fluffing to bring it to maximum beauty. Now it's finally ready for the do-it-yourself addict. In this case, the do-it-yourself enthusiast is not doing it for herself, but for her niece. And what she has to do to complete the garment is first cut the lining and interlining. The parts of the wrap have come with all edges taped. Flat tape where the edges will be joined, bend back tape on the borders. To a male observer, it may sound pretty complicated, but they say a woman who's any kind of a seamstress at all has no trouble following the instructions. The fur industry has made some mighty strides since the first caveman wrapped himself in an untanned hide. Now it watches with interest an experiment that's right in step with the times and may mean another big step forward, broadening the market for one more product, formerly considered the private preserve of the very rich. An Indianapolis dye maker studies the design for a class ring, a piece of jewelry that will serve as a graduate's permanent memento of treasured high school or college days. The delicate detail in reverse has been carefully sculpted into cold steel by hand here at the Herf Jones Company. A wax impression indicates every plane and facet is perfect, so after a heat hardening process, along goes the dye to a hydraulic press, which with a thrust of 600,000 pounds squeezes a gold alloy into every groove and crevice of the die. So great was the hammer blow that it's something of a task getting the half section of ring loose. Hardened by the hammer, the ring halves must be softened by annealing, then are matched up like this, joined, trimmed to fit an individual finger, and finally are ready to be rounded. A strip of heavy leather protects the detail on the shank. A series of furnaces fuse gold into the joints, leaving not a trace of seam between the component parts. Next step, enameling, a very delicate operation that calls for a steady hand indeed. With the enamel hardened in another furnace, then stone polished, and with delicate detail highlighted by the engravers, the ring at last is ready for the gem. This operation could be done by machine, but not with the precision master hand craftsmen can achieve. The important thing is to get a perfect fit without stress or strain that might cause the stone to chip or become loose. 
And that just about does it, except for a polishing and highlighting that brings out the full effect of the skill and materials that have gone into this piece of jewelry. A final inspection, the last of many, is conducted by the factory superintendent himself. When school days end, any boy or girl will pretend to be highly relieved that it's all over. But the fact that they really cherish their experiences in school is best attested to by the pride they take in their class ring. An amusement park at Los Angeles. Every imaginable type of ride is going full tilt creating for the customers the realistic and somehow pleasurable illusion that they're in an airplane that's out of control. As a matter of fact, many of these rides were made by an airplane manufacturer, or at least a former airplane manufacturer. The Salem, Oregon firm still bears the name of Ierly Aircraft, even though it gave up planes for devices like these more than a quarter of a century ago. This ride is called the Midjo Racer, it lets young passengers do a certain amount of steering as they go round and round. Not enough, though, to get them into any trouble. Inspecting the rides after they're finished, particularly to make certain they're safe, is one of the biggest phases of production. Hour after hour, they put the rides through their paces before dismantling them again for shipment to a customer. Here, an unfinished car for a ride called the Rocco Plane is inspected. It's much like a Ferris wheel, but with added thrills. Extra thrills take a lot of engineering and a lot of trial and error experimentation with scale models, as in the case of a new ride called the Mad Tea Party. No, the idea isn't that people try to drink out of the cups, but that they ride in much larger versions of the same. And if that doesn't give them a thrill, well, at least it ought to make them a little queasy. Need any digging done in your garden? Here's the granddaddy of all power shovels that could take the topsoil off a good-sized city lot in one swoop. The cab is a mere eight stories tall, while the dipper holds 45 cubic yards. At this Hanna Coal Company strip mine in eastern Ohio, the giant shovel clears about a million cubic yards of overburden a month from the top of buried veins of coal. That king-size digging machine came from here, at the Marion Power Shovel Company of Marion, Ohio. None of the other equipment these men produce is quite as big as the one in use at the Hanna Pits, but they're all pretty good size. Here, for example, an excavator part is machined on a boring mill big enough to handle passengers. Despite their size, the parts must be finished to precision tolerances, so they'll continue functioning smoothly under the terrific strains they have to take on the job. In addition to excavating, Marion machines are widely used for handling bulk materials of all kinds, especially on construction jobs and other places where extreme ruggedness and great power are required. This plant was one of the first anywhere to use an electric eye to guide an automatic burning machine in cutting a complicated part out of steel. On the erection floor, an electric shovel is assembled. The upper frame that will support the shovel cab descends onto the lower frame. The machines built here are another of those products the public never buys, but which serve the public every day by serving industry. For example, this medium-sized electric shovel may help build a dam or a highway, a factory or office building. 
and in mining operations of all kinds, whether it's coal, iron ore, bauxite, gypsum, gravel, or whatever, excavators of this magnitude help bring out the vital minerals we need, making possible strip mining that eliminates the need for men to spend their working days underground, while at the same time opening up deposits that would not otherwise be economical to mine. petroleum loading platform tank overflows and ignites. Within seconds, the flames roar high in the air as a dense cloud of smoke hampers the work of firemen who move in behind the protection of a fog spray. No, it's not a disaster in the making. In fact, this fire may prevent disasters in the future. For it was set off purposely at a fireman's training ground in Portland, Oregon, to increase the knowledge of city firemen and industrial workers on the ways of combating oil fires. A crowd is on hand for the inaugural demonstrations at the training ground, which was built and contributed to the city by the Oregon Petroleum Industries Committee. The visitors see some remarkable applications of modern firefighting techniques. Here, a piece of key equipment, represented by the sheet of paper, is protected from the flames until the fuel supply can be cut off. The paper remains intact. In the next demonstration, a drum of gasoline is heated until a jet of flame issues from the vent. Proper procedure here is to flush away the ground fire, cool off the container, then snuff out the negligible flame that remains. Just about every conceivable type of oil and gas fire is created to show the firemen, professional and non-professional alike, how each type requires its own special treatment. Gone is the day when, regardless of what kind of fire it is, you merely turn a hose on it. Do that with an oil fire, and in many cases, you're likely to make it worse. But here's a fire on an arrangement of pipes and valves known as a Christmas tree. In this case, a heavy stream of water is desirable to clear away the blazing oil on the ground beneath the Christmas tree. Then the fog spray lets the men get close enough to shut off the flow. Many are the weapons, and just as numerous are the tactics that can be used in battling fires. At this training ground sponsored by Portland Industries, it's expected that interested companies before long will provide props for instruction in all of them, helping to make Portland's fire laddies among the most effective in the nation. In America, large and small business are completely interdependent. One cannot get along without the other. This is a good system. It gets things done. It enables all of us to buy more of the good things in life at the lowest possible price. For instance, there are more than 3,000 major manufacturers of food and food products. Their success depends upon the 680,000 retail stores which sell their food to the consumer. In the petroleum industry, more than 800 refineries and natural gas plants call upon 400,000 local outlets to place their products in the hands of the public. An old New England grist mill at Sudbury, Massachusetts, grinding out whole wheat flour as in colonial days for a woman named Mrs. Margaret Rudkin. Is she a home baker turning out loaves for her family? Well, that's how Mrs. Rudkin started a few years ago. But the bread she made from this high-gluten, high-protein flour was so good, her friends started asking her to bake for them. And now the business has grown, so it takes trailer trucks to haul the flour to her Pepperidge Farm Bakery at Norwalk, Connecticut. Unbleached flour is sifted, then carried by screw drive to hoppers in the mixing room. Meanwhile, certain other elements, like milk, honey, and butter, are thoroughly mixed, and they too are fed by pipes to the mixing room.
Here, the pre-mixed ingredients are carefully measured out, just the right amount of each for 80 loaves of bread. Last to go in is the flour. Now the dough is put on the hook, as they call it. This refers to the mixing hook that stirs the dough. It's the same sort of hook used on a home mixer and is considered superior for mixing bread ingredients. From the mixer, the dough goes to a raising room, then arrives here to be weighed out into one loaf segments and kneaded by hand in the old-fashioned way that distributes the yeast bubbles through the dough, giving the bread a smooth texture. Moving along by conveyor belt, the dough is placed in individual pans. It'll now be allowed to rise some more before going into the ovens. An arm reaches out and draws the loaves into the mechanical oven, where they stay for about an hour at a temperature of 400 degrees. Emerging gold and brown and ready for wrapping. Some, but not all of the loaves, are sliced before being wrapped. 4,000 loaves an hour can be produced on the equipment in this plant, along with great quantities of rolls, brown and serve items, poultry stuffing, and other bread products. Quite an increase over the few loaves Mrs. Rudkin baked for her friends only 15 years ago. But despite the stepped-up production, there's still a full quota of enjoyment in every slice. Research headquarters for a company in Newark, New York. Do they look like greenhouses to you? Well, that's what they are. For the company is Jackson and Perkins, a name associated with roses the world over. We're about to see some of the steps that go into the development here of more than 10,000 new varieties of roses each year. Eugene Borner, director of research, collects pollen from a rose he intends to cross with another to produce a new hybrid. The pollen is brushed onto the pistil of the second rose. In nature, this job is handled by the wind and by insects who carry the pollen from one flower to another on their wings and feet. But here, it must be known exactly which roses are involved in the cross. To ensure that insects or a stray breeze won't ruin the experiment, a paper bag is placed over the flower. In about three months, the plant produces a rose hip or rose apple, which contains the seeds of the newly created hybrid. The seeds are planted in beds called flats. As soon as they produce roots, they're transferred to small flower pots, then into larger and larger pots until they are ready to be brought outside. New varieties that show promise are placed in trial gardens in all parts of the country, so it can be determined how they will do under every climatic condition. Then they're graded according to vigor, appearance of the leaves, size of the flower, fragrance, firmness of the petals, and a dozen other factors. Finally, from the year's production of 10,000 new varieties, top management must make the final decision, must select the two or three that will be produced in quantity. Theirs is the task of picking the ones that will sell and rejecting the ones that won't. And a mistake here could cost a small fortune. Here's a field of 800,000 bushes, not one of whose blossoms will ever be marketed. They're wild roses, two years old, grown to supply a sturdy root system for the hybrids. 
budding eyes from the hybrid plants are grafted to the stems of the wild plants. The flowers that will result will have no resemblance whatever to wild roses. Once the new shoot is well established, the top of the wild bush will be cut off and discarded. This not only assures the hybrid of healthy roots, but permits one new plant to produce many additional plants in a single season. One year later, the plants are dug up like this and prepared for market. The plants are bundled, their tops are trimmed, and they're sent off to special storage cellars to await shipment to greenhouses or home gardeners. Time was, the firm sold its roses only to big growers who supplied retail florists. But a display the company put on at the New York World's Fair aroused such widespread interest that it went into mail order selling, which now accounts for the major share of its volume of more than 10 million rose bushes a year. The proper use of this nation's renewable natural resources, soil, water, forests, grass, fish, wildlife, and so on, poses a serious problem for all Americans. Careless waste of such resources can gravely affect our entire future. Federal control over the use of our natural riches should be kept to a minimum. Industry endorses only those practices and programs, whether from local, county, state, or federal sources, that contribute to permanent conservation sound development, and wise utilization of our resources. The job is mainly one for non-governmental groups. Industry on Parade looks in on a Salt Lake City plant whose major function is dissolving in water crystals of a chemical called ammonium dehydrogen phosphate, then converting the solution back into crystals. The large, optically perfect crystals thus produced are vital to the national defense. And the job of making the big crystals is one that requires two months' time here at King Laboratory Incorporated. These particular crystals are going to be used as seeds for the production of other crystals. Control of the temperature in the tanks is the key factor. Insulating blankets around the tanks help the automatic controls gradually bring down the temperature at a pre-controlled rate. The big reason why large, perfect crystals are rarely found in nature is that fluctuating temperatures interrupt their formation. Looking down into the tanks through a glass porthole on top, you see this. The seed crystals rotating back and forth, day and night, for eight long weeks, as layer after layer of clear and symmetrical crystals build up on the seed. Pretty to look at, but as we said, very useful too. For these crystals are piezoelectric. If you compress them, they give off electricity. And if you subject them to electricity, they give off sound. Thus, the vital purpose they will serve is in sonar equipment used by the Navy for sending and receiving sound underwater. Before they can do this, however, they must undergo extensive additional processing. Like a diamond, which is also a crystal, incidentally, the ADP, as it's called, must be cut by an expert who follows the plane surfaces and thus leaves a minimum of waste. Now the crystals must be cut down still further into very thin wafers. This little wafer, when brought to exact dimensions, accurate to a thousandth of an inch, will be the heart of a piece of equipment that permits a naval vessel to detect the presence of submarines and also is vital to the operation of submarines themselves. Through the electrodes being added here, a flow of electricity will cause the crystal to send a burst of sound out through the water, an echoing sound returning from the bottom of the ocean, a school of fish, or any other object nearby will cause the crystal to give off an electrical impulse which activates dials and oscilloscopes and supplies a wealth of information. Wherever the fleet sails, on the water or under it, those little crystals sail with it, helping to keep it safe.
corrugated boxes weighing mere ounces, being loaded with products of industry weighing many pounds. The boxes will carry their heavy loads safely despite weeks or months of all kinds of rough handling. We've come to accept the ruggedness and shock resistance of corrugated boxes without realizing that they're actually made of paper. At firms like Samuel M. Langston Company in Camden, New Jersey, no one ever forgets that a paper product can be so strong. For it was this company that helped develop this surprising use for paper, and which today, after half a century, is a leading designer and builder of machines used in the manufacture of corrugated paper and associated products. The machines that corrugate paper, or paperboard, are made up in large part of rollers, rollers that will actually do much more than corrugate. They'll apply glue and a paper facing to both sides of the crimp paperboard, for example. Then print trademarks and other information on the outer sides. Cut slots on the boxes so they can be quickly, easily assembled. And do just about everything but assemble the box and put in the contents. This is another of those industries which serve only other industries. One whose products we ourselves may never use or even see but which contribute much to our way of living because they make the things we do use more convenient and less expensive. To dramatize for visitors to the plant the amazing qualities that their machines can impart to paper, workers here like to stage an occasional demonstration of how much weight even a tomato carton can hold. America is growing fast. Four million babies are born every year. That's 11,000 a day, 458 an hour, more than seven a minute. By 1975, we'll have an estimated population of 220 million. With a population of that size, it means we'll have to create more than 22 million new jobs in the next two decades. To add this number of jobs means industry must invest some $264 billion in plant, tools, and equipment. In order to raise this money, we must preserve the incentive to invest and create a fair tax policy to fulfill the promise of the future. A homemaker prepares a new dessert guided by a recipe in her favorite family magazine. It's strawberry cheesecake, something she's trying her hand at for the first time. She might assume that the recipe was concocted by a famous chef in the employ of the magazine. And some dishes do originate in that manner. But more than likely, the recipe came from a reader just like herself, who developed it by experimenting with an earlier recipe in the hope of giving her family a pleasant surprise. To learn a little about how this recipe got into print, let's visit the magazine's editorial offices. Better Homes and Gardens is put out by Meredith Publishing Company of Des Moines. 90% of the recipes it carries are submitted by readers and, surprisingly enough, those recipes, like everything else printed in the magazine, get a careful going over by the very top editors. Out of hundreds of recipes studied each month, only those that sound downright delicious and practical are sent to be tried out in the magazine's tasting test kitchens. Here in the modern kitchens, five home economists are kept busy full-time baking, broiling, frying, and roasting foods nominated for the honor of being labeled a prize-tested recipe. Products of the kitchens are studied and measured with all kinds of scientific equipment. But this is the most important hurdle of all, the reaction of a tasting panel. Is the cheesecake too bland? What about the color? Do you like the texture? How does it compare with other cheesecake you've eaten? There'll be dozens of similar questions, and only if the answers are preponderantly favorable will the recipe appear in the magazine. Next step, the artwork. This includes drawings and photographs in black and white or full color. A strawberry filled cornucopia is an appropriate centerpiece to accompany the cheesecake. And finally, after comparable detail work in every department, the magazine goes to press and tucked away in its pages is the formula for a dessert that an estimated one million women will either try out immediately or clip for insertion in their Better Homes and Gardens cookbooks. 
one million cheesecakes. No wonder those people back in Des Moines are so determined that when their handiwork arrives here, the results have got to be good. In this case, it would appear evident they have nothing to worry about whatsoever.